how did you first uh, come to uh, meet uh, David Lynch? Well, uh, I guess the story goes it was in the front yard of um, of a girl, uh, <laughs> David's girlfriend, uh, at age 15. And, um, you know, I guess uh, he was on the way out and I was on the way in. But um, we, uh, you know, we met there and... Um, uh, I think the first day he asked me, you know, what my father did, and I told him he was a painter. Right. And that uh, kind of changed everything. And, uh, you know, we became fast friends and, uh, you know, went through high school together. And mm -hmm. over the years, uh, you know, we lost contact, but, you know, came together again. And it's, you know, it's... Long time, man, since 1960. Yeah, it's a long relationship. 1960, yeah. Yeah. Didn't he say that you, you stole his girlfriend, too, at the time? That <laughs> I don't know if he put it that way. Um, but that was, that was the point of contact, was a, was a, was a lovely young uh, lady named Linda. Right. And um, was there in Alexandria, Virginia. And, um, you know, like I said, we were, in the, we were in the same high school fraternity and... Uh, um, you know, we 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 we. It was there's some good stories back from those times. Yeah. Now, Dave, I had read interviews with Mr. Lynch where he actually said that he had never considered that you could actually make a career out of being an artist until he got to know your stepfather, and that was the big epiphany for him and what what ultimately drove him to pursue it as a career. Is yeah, well, that, that's correct. Well, I think that's true. Both he and Jack Fisk. Yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, when you're 15. You know, you're kind of, you know, kind of um, don't know where you're going. At least most people don't. But uh, David was one guy who who had a direction, and um, you know, he'd he'd rather he'd rather paint than than go out with the guys. Yeah. And uh, he uh, he actually rented his first studio uh, from Bush from Bushnell, my stepdad. Yeah. Uh, there in Alexandria, I think it was off Henry Street, and then he had another one on Cameron Street later. Mm. And you know, I remember, I remember those days. Uh, you know, I remember them well. I remember the the night that Kennedy was lying in state in the Capitol, and you know, we were up in David's studio having a couple of beers, and we decided, well, let's go down, let's go down and look at the casket oh. lying in state in the Capitol Rotunda. So we jumped in Dave's family car and headed into town. And, of course, the lines went from the Capitol down to 16th Street and then back again. And we stood in line all night long, uh, you know, with blankets wrapped around us to keep us warm. This was, you know, obviously in November. And I remember one person in line commenting that um, he said, are you brothers? And I said, well, no, but David said, we're, we're from the same tribe. <laughs> Did, didn't David uh, usher at JFK's inauguration? Uh, well, I think he did, actually. Um, he was an Eagle Scout. Right. And that may have been when he was still in the Boy Scouts. Um, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't know that. Um, but I think, he, yeah, I think uh, he, 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 he has the story where he, he was, uh, you know, in the uh, outside of the White House, and he saw the limousine um, pulling out with... Um, you know, with with three living presidents, uh, you know, was um, was Kennedy and uh, and and Nixon and Johnson. Mm. Wow. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about his his background and and, and get your take on something. Um, he was born in Montana, and he, he moved around a lot. And his father was a agricultural research scientist, and his mother was an English tutor, I believe. I believe that's correct. Yeah. Um, and it seems like a, a painfully kind of normal <laughs> upbringing. So what is it about, uh, your take on it, uh, these kind of normal origins that he had that uh, inform his work as an artist and a filmmaker? Wow, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, David, David is about, I mean, despite what people might think of his work, is, um, I mean, besides being extremely bright and intuitive uh you know he's he's about as normal a guy as you'd ever want to meet um you know uh he laughs a lot um you know he always has um 
you know, I mean, I remember, I remember one summer, Dave, David had needed a, a merit badge for Eagle Scouts for community service, and um, and at the time there was a kind of a fad of running around the neighborhood and stenciling people's uh, house numbers onto the side of the curb for, I think we charged a buck or something like that, and uh, you know, so David saw a great opportunity to. Um, you know, to make a little money and and get his merit badge, uh, uh, you know, uh, credit at the same time. But as, to answer your question, you know, it's, um, I, you know, it's, I don't know where it comes from. Yeah, because it seems like such a an idyllic kind of upbringing that he had, and and you see his films, and you know, obviously there's there's a lot of emotion and power and 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 love in his films as well, but they're pretty dark uh so I, I guess that's that's the bulk of the question is where that kind of comes from well pretty pretty dark is is a good way to put it um <laughs> that is that's... To, be, to be sure um but you know with with david it you know it always is and always has been you know about you know the idea right and um and you know here's a guy you know that's that that falls in love all the time Mm-hmm. You know whether it's a, a piece of furniture or a painting, um, you know, or or a film, um, you know. And with him, it's it's all about being, you know, true to the idea. Yeah. And I guess that's a, you know, I mean, you know, mid Midwestern folks, you know, have a tendency to kind of be straight straight shooters. And you know, David is uh, David is a straight shooter. And. Um, you know, uh, I think he likes he likes to evoke mood, and you know, of course, darkness is one way of doing that. Yeah. He, but when you hang around the guy, you know, he'll tell stories that'll have you on the floor, doubled over with laughter. <laughs> There's no darkness in his life at all well, that, that I can see. I mean, uh, you know. Well, I, I want to talk to you about uh, the documentary you made uh, of, of David Lynch. It's called uh, "Pretty as a Picture: The Art of David Lynch." Uh, one of the high points of it for me was the, the kind of reunion of sorts that took place at the original location where Eraserhead was filmed. Yeah. Um, now, you were a part of that uh, production back in the uh, 70s. I know I know it was a very arduous, slow production. It took about seven years to complete, I believe. Uh, how present were you during that time, and, and what memories stick out for you the most from that shoot? Well, uh, you know, I moved out here in '72, so I think David was uh, David was already at the AFI, um, and I think he's probably already starting uh, Eraserhead. Um, and um, uh, you know, our contact was initiated by the fact that you know I called him, and he basically needed uh, he needed some crew. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he had Fred and, and Catherine and 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 um, and Jack and uh, some other folks, um, um, Charlotte and, and the gang down there. You know, working you know all through the night and sleeping during the day. And um, you know, he needed uh, he needed uh, he needed some help for the the man in the planet scene, mm-hmm. um, and he needed some characters for. Uh, the fighting man scene, which which I appear in, uh, and it's not just myself. I, I, um, Dolores, my wife, and my uh, two kids, Jennifer and Brad. Although I think he uh, may have cut them out, but they are there in the credits as well. Um, but um, you know, it was just uh, you know, it was great to see an old friend, and you know, I'd never you know, I came out here to go to Cal Arts, and here was a great opportunity to come down and. You know, see a see an old friend. Uh, you know, working on a working on his film project. So, so how much time did you did you spend with him on the on the set for that project? And well, you know, a couple of days maybe. That's all. Um, but um, you know, over a period of time, I think uh, there was another another scene where where the fetuses drop out of the sky on a stage. I forget what that where that scene comes, but uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> What else can you say? Feet is right. dropping out of the dropping out of the sky like rain. That's all it's there been, is. It's been in so many movies since then. That's yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> at this point, you know. But you know, I'll never forget. Um, 
you know the uh, after all those years. I mean, there were there were the film was dark went dark for a number of years. You know, while David was either out of money uh, or 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 you know doing something else, and um, I know uh, you know the scene some scenes that he shot with Jack uh, Nance were you know like separated by like five years, mm. and uh, you know he was concerned that Jack would uh, would match would would be able to match, but they you know they're it's seamless, and he was working with Alan Splett at the time. And I'll never forget the night they sh- they had the screening uh, at at the AFI, uh, you know, cast and crew screening. And you know, David's not one; he doesn't like being in the theater when when his stuff's being shown. Right. At least I he used to be that way. I don't know if he's gotten over it or not. But um, you know, I, he likes to kind of sneak out. And um, and it was a you know it was a, a, a double system, so it was everything was still kind of you know pre pre uh you know timed and all that and uh the film came to an end and it didn't have any music at the end and it didn't have it just went to black mm-hmm. and there was silence and there was more silence and then people kind of just started getting up and there was more silence and they started walking out of the theater and and David thought everybody hated it and uh you know we all kind of assembled in the room next door for some refreshments and it was only then that you know people started you know that david found out that oh indeed the opposite was true that people were just completely spellbound by seeing this i mean we all knew at the time that you know here is here is um cinematic genius at work um and you know it's still i it's still you know without a doubt i think it's still it's still my favorite uh, david lynch uh, picture that and i think um i think uh, blue velvet is probably right my, my yeah next. i'm sure that they felt that they had never seen which they hadn't they had never seen anything like it before and that's the one thing about david lynch's films you, they're not derivative of other films you you definitely have not seen them ever before well seen or heard right. you know, david has always been really uh, you know picky about about the sound and rightfully so you know because it's it's there's two you know there's two senses working here right know, so i want to ask you about that too because there's there's a section of your documentary with that shows uh david in the studio with uh, angelo badalamenti yeah longtime composer yeah uh can you tell me about his use and his understanding of music and sound well, you know, I um David, you know, when we were in high school, uh, you know, he he played the bongos. Mm-hmm. David's got the fastest fingers of anybody alive, man. He can fly on a on a set of bongos and con- and congas, you know, like you just wouldn't believe. But I'm I'm not sure that he reads music. Um uh he just he it just he, he just understands it and he and when he hears it, and he sees it, he knows because he's so true to the idea that he knows when it's when it's right and when it's not right and uh and angelo and 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 he are are kindred spirits in in that in that regard i mean there's a there's a one of my favorite sequences in 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 pretty as a picture is uh where they're working together in the studio in new york uh you know working on working out a, an an idea and uh you know david 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 comes up with with a couple of notes and, and angelo will play them out and you know and 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 they'll work on it and and that's that's basically the way it, it sort of comes together yeah perfect creative partners in a right well yeah they they are and uh, you know they're both great guys i mean you know angelo was was most i mean you know the soundtrack for my show you know basically it was the soundtrack a lot of outtakes from uh, lost highway mm-hmm. um you know that I went over was privileged to go over and, and watch being recorded in uh, in Prague. Well, it does take place during the shooting of Lost Highway, your your documentary. Yeah. Uh, so, what did you? What kind of observations did you make about the way uh, he controls a set and uh, he works his whole creative process in general? Well, you know the people that David gets around him. Um, you know uh, the sense of team. And the sense of togetherness, and uh, you know, they all understand where David wants to go. And you know, uh, you know, he's he's not you know an uh, an auteur in any stretch of the imagination. 
Um, anybody that has you know a good idea, David's open to listen. Uh, he's uh, he's a big uh, he's a big believer in fate. And if there's a mistake that happens on the set, um, you know, by golly, he'll he'll jump on that, and you know, that's wonderful. That's wonderful, you know. And uh, so he's always open. And the people that he gets around him, you know, uh, I think uh, I think you know that sort of comes through. You know, the the, uh, the first AD and 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 Peter Deming and you know the actors. Um, you know, David is so easygoing and and so relaxed, and he loves and he loves what he's doing so much that it just uh, kind of rub, rubs off on everybody, and everyone is just having a blast. Yeah. Uh, like like David says, he said, you know, you, when you start the, the production process, he says it's like being swept away. Um, you know, you get you get you, the production starts, and you know you're just you're just in the flow. Right. And uh, you know you've got the script and you've got the idea and the, and the you know you do whatever it takes to be true to the idea. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's always been the idea with David. I would think I would think as an actor it would be incredibly freeing in a way to to perform in a David Lynch film. And you you interviewed uh, several actors from the Lost Highway uh, set, and what was their general impression of that whole experience of being directed by him? Well, they love him. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, 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 uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, come on, uh, the guy plays Mr. Eddie. Robert Logia. Robert Logia compared him to John Huston for crying out loud. Wow, wow. I mean, you know, compliments like that just don't come out of someone like Logia. Right, right, right. And um, I'll never forget. I was doing, trying to get a rough cut together of of the documentary, and I went went over and showed it to David. And after after watching it, he said he said, "Tobe, you know what you got to do? You got to you got to take all of these sequences and you put each one of them on a three by five card, and you take that stack of cards and you throw it up in the air and you let it fall down and you pick them all up and you edit that." <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, Dave. And so I, you know, and of course I got started on it. But then what it did was it gave me fresh eyes. Right. And, you know, I didn't actually edit the whole thing together, but I started down an, a new way and it made me see things differently. This is, this is, the, this is the effect this, this guy has on, on the people around him. Wow. He uh, trusts. He has, he has immense trust in the people that he has, that he has around him. Yes. You, you mind if we take a phone call? Not at all. Uh, let me see. A 301 area code. You are on. Go ahead. 301. Okay, 301 is not there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Perhaps 817 will be. Okay. Uh, 817 area code. You're on the air. Go right ahead. Hey, guys. This is uh, John with the Dead Air Show. Hey, John. I just wanted to, you know, call in real quick and just say, you know, because of David Lynch, a big influence on my life. I've never, ever, ever had to take any acid. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's a great feeling to know that I can say, you know, I was drug-free in my teenage years because I didn't need it. I was able to have my mind, you know, opened up and get to see other weird things without actually having to take drugs. Thanks that, to David. That's a great point. That's that is a, a very point. good point, John. <laughs> Thanks it's very not much. a backhanded compliment at all. It's actually a big compliment. Lynch is uh, is a visionary, and uh, I'm glad that you guys are uh, paying tribute to him. So you guys have a great show. You Thank too. you so much, John. We'll talk Thank to you later. Bye bye now. The strange thing is that uh, you know some of the best David Lynch movies can be far more haunting than some of the scariest drug experiences out there. That's that's true. That that's that's very true. true. They stick uh, with you for years. Toby, how do our listeners purchase your film? Um, well, I think it's available through. Um, through um, um, Image Entertainment, mm-hmm. um, it used to be available through his web through David's website. I mean, you know, it's been it's been uh, you know and out for for ten years now. Yeah. Um, I mean, they can you know they can get it they can get it I guess directly from me. Um, um, but uh, Image has the um, has the DVD okay. um, and uh, you know that's probably the best way to do it.